Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us and welcome to this NECW plenary session on carbon capture, utilization, and storage, a key part of the solution. I'm JP Brusson, a partner at Latham & Watkins in New York City, where I advise clients on climate, low carbon, and net zero issues, including CCS. First, I would like to thank the Climate Action Reserve for convening this annual conference including Craig Hubert and Jenny Watt. I, I believe I did my first NACW in 2007, and it is a pleasure to participate in this event again uh, this year. So we have seen tremendous growth in interest in subjects. To quote a January article from the New York Times, a surge of corporate money could soon transform carbon removal from science fiction to reality, close quote. And according to a Bloomberg article from last week, ExxonMobil has just proposed a giant $100 billion CC hub CCS hub project in the Gold Coast, which on its own only would sequester more than 50 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. Quite an achievement. So to make sense of these uh, developments and discuss the potential opportunities and challenges associated with CCS project, I am very excited that we have convened a panel comprising some of the most knowledgeable experts in this area. Joining me today, starting with uh, the bottom right on my screen, Kathy Reheis Boyd, who is president and CEO of the West Western State Petroleum Association where Kathy manages WESPA's activities on the West Coast. Kathy, I know you've been following CCS, a member of California's Blue Ribbon Panel on CCS in 2010, and I know that your member companies are heavily involved in CCS projects in the US, but also globally. So it is a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us, Kathy. Thank you. Second, Dr. Julio Friedman, who is a senior research scholar at the Center for Global Clean Energy Policy at Columbia University, where Dr. Friedman leads a new initiative in carbon management. Dr. Friedman is one of the most widely known and authoritative experts globally in CCS. I can attest to that because I went to the COP in Madrid and uh, Dr. Friedman is literally a star of the COP. Everyone knows him. So we are delighted to have him with us today. And Julio, I am delighted that uh, you are wear, wearing the Carbon Wrangler outfit. I did not expect anything less. But I'm very happy that you are wearing it. So welcome. JP, you are too kind. It's really a treat to be here. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. And finally, Matt Baker, who is Deputy Secretary for Energy with the California Natural Resources Agency. Prior to joining state government, Matt was the Energy and Climate Program Officer for the Hewlett Foundation in California. And prior to joining uh, the Hewlett Foundation, Matt was a commissioner at the Board of Utility in Colorado. Matt, I know you play a central role in CCS policy and regulatory issues in California, and it's absolutely an honor to have you join our panel today. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. Wonderful. Well, with these intros uh, completed, let's jump right into the topic. Um, and let's talk about the basics, right? What is CCS? Uh, the New York Times was asking, is it science fiction, right? Some people can say, is it magic? Dr. Friedman, can you tell us what is CCS? Is it real? Are there existing projects out there? Uh, give us a primer, please. Sure, so let's start with what, it is, carbon capture is established technology uh, that we've had for a very long time. The first carbon capture facility was deployed in 1938. The first large scale storage project was deployed in, 2000, in 1972. Uh, the first big climate focused project was in 1996. We've been doing this for a long time. There are 21 commercial scale operating facilities around the world today. They capture about 40 million tons of CO2 a year. The uh, aggregate volume is on the order of 300 million tons of CO2 that's been captured and stored. And uh, there's dozens of projects coming up around the world today, 
following hundreds of pilots. So this is something we really understand well and, and have done for a long time. Uh, it's mostly two parts, carbon capture part and the carbon storage part. Uh, the carbon capture part is really just concentrating CO2 either from industrial facilities like power plants or steel mills or cement plants or from the air uh, to get it to very high purity, about 95% concentration or better. The storage part is injection in the deep subsurface. You're way, way, way below drinking water. You're typically a mile underground and injecting it into geological formations that are configured to store this stuff. So uh, we, the Earth's crust is well configured to store CO2. The capacity to store CO2 is on the order of 10 trillion tons of capacity. So we've, we've got plenty to do. Uh, there's uh, two other parts that are usually involved. One of them is transportation. CO2 is moved by pipeline usually, although people are also looking at moving CO2 by ship. Uh, and you take it from where it's captured to where it's stored. Uh, it is also possible to use CO2. Uh, right now, uh, the biggest use for CO2 is an enhanced oil recovery. Uh, about 75% uh, uh, of the enhanced oil recovery that is done today uses man-made CO2. Uh, but increasingly, we are looking for other ways to use the CO2, to put it into cement and concrete, to convert it into fuels and chemicals, other kinds of things like that. Very, very uh, instructive, uh, Dr. Friedman. Thank you for that, that primer. Uh, and why is there such a, a renewed interest uh, for CCS today? Like, why, why is it that CCS appears to be on the radar screen of, of every regulator globally? The main reason why is net zero. Uh, we have reframed the climate discussion correctly to say we have to get to net zero some point soon or else we're in trouble. And policy, regulations, and markets are all following net zero. Uh, in order to get zero, you have to do two things, reduce emissions and remove emissions. And reducing emissions and removing emissions is hard. From existing infrastructure, it's very hard. So mm -hmm. one of the very few things you can do with an existing plant is actually capture the CO2 or shut it down. Those are kind of the options for reducing emissions. So if you don't want to shut down a facility, you got to operate it, but stop the emissions from entering the air and oceans. That's the capture and storage part. The other thing is you must remove large volumes of CO2. To hit net zero, there's always an irreducible fraction. Right now, about 20% of global emissions, we have no solutions for at all. And so if we want to get to net zero, we have to unemit those parts. And the carbon capture and storage piece looks important for that. That includes things like biohydrogen with CCS, direct air capture, similar kinds of things. And those technology sets would complement things like trees and soils, the same way that conventional carbon capture would complement things like efficiency in the deployment of renewables. Okay, so so basically CCS, uh, Julio, it is contemplated by the current set of international agreements when those agreements are setting forth targets. They contemplate some type of rollout of CCS uh, globally? So, so uh, all nations now are signatories to the Paris Accord. So there is no market which doesn't think about carbon, <laughs> like all the global markets care about it. And uh, 10 countries have already named CCS in their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Accord. Another dozen are gonna come out probably in the next year. Um, and even for those countries that haven't formally said they're gonna do CCS, many of them have tacitly said they're gonna do that. So in a place like the UK, it's formal. In a place like Denmark or Germany, it's tacit, but they both are developing CCS as part of their net zero agenda. Interesting, interesting. Well, and, and Matt, you know, to tell us, you know, CCS is so important at the global level. Uh, how does CCS uh, play out in connection with the suite of, of levers, right, that California has in order to achieve the state's own climate objectives? Yeah, um, I, I would, as many people on this call probably know, California has a net zero objective of to reach by 2045. 
Uh, and to reach that goal in that time frame, you know, we're really going to have to use virtually all of the tools that are on the table. Um, you know, I would describe our approach, you know, in electricity, it's being led by renewables, predominantly wind and solar. Uh, there may be some residual power needs that are left over. Um, and it may, you know, may be necessary to apply carbon capture, among other uh, potential strategies there. Um, there's a set of emissions coming from uh, agriculture uh, and, uh, you know, and it, everybody who follows California is aware we have a, you know, we're, we're, we're facing a, an enormous wildfire risk. Um, so our lands may be moving from becoming a sink to a source. Um, and that, you know, will require us to uh, contemplate technologies like direct air capture or, uh, you know, biofuels to carbon removal, these kind of negative energy technologies. So, um, you know, I, it, it is carbon removal and carbon capture are things that we are actively looking at um, and studying right now. I would say that from a policy perspective, California, through its low carbon fuel standard, um, you know, has a carbon remo has a carbon capture uh, protocol to it, which is really driving an enormous amount of interest here in this state. Um, the you know that with the addition of the 45Q uh, incentive, uh, you know I think actually makes it, it, it has brought this technology to the point where it's it's economically viable. Um, and in California specifically, some of the things that we're looking at is you know is it possible to develop kind of a no regrets pathway in this area and some of the specific areas we're looking at are you know uh is there a way to uh address the you know the the, the issue of what to do with wood waste from our forest management policies to help reduce our wildfire risk um is there a way to deal with emissions that are uh, almost pure streams of co2 that are uh, emitted into the atmosphere um what can we do about the hard to abate sectors, whether it's cement or steel, um, you know, where we don't really have solutions beyond trying to capture the emissions at the end, at the end of the tailpipe. Uh, you know, and then finally, with regards to our emissions in agriculture, we're also looking at direct air capture. That's, that's very interesting, Matt, because, you know, historically, when one thinks about CCS, uh, one thinks about the power sector, right? And we are all aware of the very large billion-dollar projects, you know, that received DOE grants at the federal level that ultimately never saw the light of day because of the technological issues. Um, and that was in the year 2000. Thinking about the Future Gen project, for example, but there were two of them in the U.S. So, so obviously California is not necessarily looking at CCS for its power sector. It's looking at CCS for other sectors. Is that what I heard? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say our our uh, power sector strategy is really going to be led by wind and solar um, yeah. and energy efficiency. There, you know, but there are there there will be a need for clean dispatchable power. Um, we don't really know how big that will be, um, and that might be a place where carbon removal or carbon capture uh, is is useful. We're looking really at more kind of. Uh, you, you know, like I said, kind of things that are no regrets that we can do right now. Got it. Got it. Well, you know, let, let, let me do this. Let me ask Kathy a couple of questions and then turn to Julio. Uh, Kathy, um, you know, I, I think Matt laid out, you know, a, a potential scope of application of CCS projects in California. C can you tell us about what your member companies are doing whether, you know, in California today, you know, or globally uh, in situation where, you know, would present an illustration of how things could be rolled out in California that, you know, involve the application of CCS, uh, not to the power sector, but, you know, presumably, uh, you know, your member company sector, refining and natural gas. Do, do you have any examples or, you know, uh, picture that you could share with us? Yeah, thank you, JP. And and first of all, and and you know, Dr. Friedman touched on on some of this, and uh, as did Matt. But uh, I first like to say that you know, 
CCS is obviously a climate game changer from our perspective, and all of our members are rising to that challenge, really, to deal with with the changing climate. So, it's it's one of those few technologies, right, that's able to really uh, cost effectively mitigate CO2 and reduce or eliminate emissions from all large scale industrial sources. So. We all know it, and as Matt noted, it's, it's not necessarily the silver bo bullet, but it is a critical tool to reversing these trends. And, and we could enable the United States, frankly, to safely capture and store hundreds of millions of metric tons uh, a year that otherwise would be released into the atmosphere. So, you know, as Dr. Friedman said, it's just one of the few technologies that really has the potential to significantly make an impact here. And, and obviously, as Matt said, it's it's one that will achieve, hopefully help achieve the net zero climate goals that California has. So it's it's super important that uh, that we are involved in this and we're looking at it. And as you know, globally, uh, as mentioned, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm curious, I, I had Dr. Freeman that were 26 large scale CCUS facilities. So whether it's 20, 21 or 26, uh, it's up there that are operating uh, globally in 39 more facilities are certainly in development and 17 new commercial facilities enti entering that, that pipeline uh, since 2019. 12 out of 17 of them are in the United States, which is exciting. And um, as Matt said, in California, we have to have this happen because we have carbon neutrality goals by 2045 that have to be met. And Lord Livermore National Labs, as you know, has done a study that says we cannot meet our goals in California without CCS. Um, so I am encouraged that Matt is um, uh, on the same page with us on this because frankly, I have been involved in this issue since 2015 and we still do not have a program in California that is uh, up and running. We certainly have some in the pipeline. Hopefully we'll get many more uh, with the emphasis we need to put on this now, but it, it has not been in California uh, prominent, and I'd hope in this conversation we can get into the conversation as why that is, because California is a leader in many things, but it has not been a leader in CCS, and we've been talking about it for a very long time, and our members are anxious, committed, have announced, have discussed, have tried uh, to move projects forward. So um, I really hope we can talk a little bit, JP, about what is it that is keeping us from going forward? It's it's a very important question, Kathy, because we are seeing projects in Texas, you know, in the Midwest. Uh, I think a couple of projects are under consideration in California, but certainly not in advance. So, so let's ask the question later as to why is that? Um, because I think it's important. Um, uh, Dr. Yeah, Freeman, I mean, yeah. you know, Go ahead. You did ask JP, you know, specific examples, as you know, Chevron just announced a, a very large project for the Central Valley. Uh, California yep. Resources Corporation, El Kill, certainly has one in the pipeline. You already mentioned yep. uh, Exxon Mobil and then Shell and Valero are certainly uh, very prominent right now in this space as well. Good. Yeah. So so all of these companies are are, are your member companies and, and they are looking at that actively. That, I think that's really important. Um, the, Dr. Friedman, tell us about the capture opportunities and more at the industrial, uh, industrial level, right? When, when we think about the emission stack, right, power is one thing, can be addressed partly through renewable energy. Uh, oil and gas, right, refining sector, we have direct applications of CCS, especially to start with around the, the, the hydrogen reformers. Uh, what, what about the more traditional industrial sectors, right? These are in some jurisdiction, the most difficult not to crack in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Are there realistically available, commercially available today, technologies, Julio, that would allow the reduction or capture of CO2 at a cement or, or glass or those other uh, uh, industries? Yes. The, the short answer here is that 90% uh, of the projects around the world are at industrial facilities. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, there is a zero carbon steel mill in the United Arab Emirates where they're capturing CO2 from steel production. Uh, there are five uh, low carbon hydrogen projects where they're capturing CO2 from steam methane reformers or gasifiers that are making hydrogen. Uh, there are 
uh, there are projects in the works right now for capturing from cement plants. Most people don't understand how big a deal this actually is. Uh, if you, depending on how you count it, if you just count the emissions from the industrial sites themselves, it's about a quarter of global emissions. If you include the power associated with that, it's about a third of global emissions come from heavy industry. It's just a huge volume. Uh, in California, in the US, and everywhere in the world now, uh, industrial emissions are either number one or number two emitting sector. This is a huge, huge amount. And the number of solutions that we have in that sector are very limited. Uh, we need high temperature heat all the time. Uh, it's very hard to do that with electrification and we don't have enough electricity supply. If we did, it'd be cheaper and better to put that into the power sector instead of the industrial sector. Uh, if we had, uh, and there's also the process emissions, just making concrete, half the emissions are from the heat, but the other half is just the chemical process of making cement. It's just, it's a byproduct. Same thing with steel making, about 40% uh, of the emissions are just byproduct chemistry. We don't have other technology options for those except for CCS. It's the only actions we can take. Last but not least, if you look at the cost in the industrial sector, uh, the cheapest options are always carbon capture or hydrogen made with carbon capture. The costs range from like 50 bucks a ton to 1200 bucks a ton. And the cheapest options are always what we call blue hydrogen, uh, conventional hydrogen paired with CCS, or uh, just post-combustion capture of carbon dioxide in these industrial facilities. Uh, it is a hugely, hugely important tool for that sector. Uh, the last thing I'll say very, very briefly uh, is that uh, if the goal is net zero, then bio hydrogen with carbon capture becomes very important. Today, if you take municipal solid waste and turn it into hydrogen, or if you take fuel waste like Matt was talking about, turn it into hydrogen, carbon footprint is effectively zero. It's very close. But if you capture the CO2 from that hydrogen production and dispose of it through utilization or deep storage, you can remove huge volumes. You can remove as much carbon today as a conventional hydrogen plant emits. Uh, and so for things like the refining sector or for things like the industrial sector, very, very important approach. Those are technologies that could have direct application in California, like right away that they're available, yes. they, they can- Right run. away. Okay. And there are cement plants in California you could retrofit. There's uh, hydrogen plants like Kathy was talking about that you could retrofit today. You could build new hydrogen facilities that would decarbonize heavy duty transportation uh, or, or other parts of the industrial sector. There are certainly power plants, which makes sense in the balance of power systems like Matt was talking about. Uh, there are direct applications today that can yield big, big climate dividends. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, let's, let's look about some of the incentive uh, for CCS projects, and then let's discuss why, despite the incentives, perhaps we're not seeing as much action as we thought we would see. But uh, obviously, there's a cost, right, to building these uh, major infrastructure projects. Uh, Julio, you mentioned $50 to $1,200 per ton of CO2. Obviously, you know, cap and trade alone uh, in California would not be sufficient to send the proper price signal because the price of a, a you know, a, a cap and trade allowance is around $20 today. It's it's borderline, right, in the EU, right, because the allowances in the EU are worth more, but it's not it's not within the price range, uh, Julio, that you just mentioned. So So let's talk about what else is available to large CCS projects in terms of financial incentive to make sure that they can get off the, the, the ground. And, and perhaps let's start with federal support through the form of uh, tax credits. Kathy, can you, can you tell us about the, 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 the currently existing 45Q uh, tax credit program at the federal level that, that exists for CCS projects? Yeah, thanks, JP. And, and this is just a critically important topic on how we can extend the 45Q tax credit for these projects because it's expiring in 2024. So it's a really key instrument for um, anyone needing to invest in these projects. So it's super, super important. And as we've said, it is not 
that we don't know the geology in California. It's not that we don't know the technology in California. It's not that our members aren't well positioned to move forward. We just have to have the political will to do it because it, it isn't it isn't a it, it just isn't a technology issue anymore. So the investment and the incentives are, are the key instrument. And as you know, I think API is advocating very strongly at the national level on 45Q to get it extended. And, and that's going to be extremely important. But also, in addition to 45Q, as you know, um, we've got a low carbon fuel standard in California that also really um, needs some modifications to make sure it can be utilized for its fullest potential. Um, and to combine that with the 45 federal tax credits to make sure these projects can pencil out because frankly, some of them just don't pencil out because you have to have the incentives from both of those to do that. And so we need some fixes there. And I think uh, ARB is open to that, but um, Matt, I think we're gonna need your active engagement on that. But in addition to that, JP, we also have this opportunity um, to incentivize the deployment of CCUS through the state's cap and trade program. And so you can do that by ensuring that the mandatory reporting requirements really recognize this reduced emissions from CCUS projects. And currently, um, they are reported via, via uh, fuel consumed, but there's no mechanism to really properly account for the emissions subsequently captured and sequestered. So, Matt, that's another one we're going to need your help on with ARB. And then lastly, I'll just say another critical in incentive could be um, to really take uh, a look at having a positive credit for the application of negative emission technologies. And we're suggesting that you can maybe look at that through maybe something like an emissions removal credit, which could be fully fungible with a cap and trade or an offset credit. And, and so I think that's something else that the resources board, and again, we're gonna need some, some help from, from Matt and the resources agency as we, as we move through this. And of course, there's other state um, options as well that have offered tax breaks and low interest loans as well to get uh, CCS projects underway. But all of those are going to be essential for moving this forward. Got it. So, so we went from a, a program in the U.S. where 10 years ago we had those massive DOE loan guarantees, which ultimately did not work for the reason we know, and it created a lot of issues with lots of articles about not the government's business to provide grants for specific technologies, right, to a more, I would call it more market-friendly um, mechanism, which is the 45Q. But yes, I've heard I've read as well, and I've worked on a project that uses the 45Q. Uh, it's not a perfect tool. As a matter of fact, you know, there's not enough money available in the financial markets to actually help decarbonize the entire United States. So that is a that, that is a problem with the 45Q. So it is being, uh, you know, considered for amendments. Um, Matt, can you tell us more about the, the two programs that uh, Kathy mentioned, you know, the LCFS, and the cap and trade program. Uh, what what is the LCFS credit? You know how does it relate to CCS? How can a company earn a CC, uh, LCFS credit, and how much is it worth? And second, you know, do you have any indication that uh, the California state is is open to addressing some of the issues that Kathy has identified to to make those programs more, um, you know, user friendly for for industry. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to just take a step back to uh, to address kind of the a little bit of the broader issue. Um, you know, as everyone's aware, California has really been a leader in the area of electricity, and it was in electricity where carbon capture really kind of first came up. Um, and in many ways, it was eclipsed by the phenomenal decreases in the cost of wind and solar. Uh, California made big investments into that into that area. We then moved into working in transportation, um, you know, and I think now with the net zero pledge um, and with the scoping plan that uh, the California Air Resources Board is about to embark upon, you know, I think you'll see more action in the area of, you know, how do we get how do we get to net zero and what do we do about, uh, you know, these these specific sectors. The. Um, the um, you know the California the, the the low carbon fuel standard I think has re has really been one of the more successful um, tools to drive both decarbonization of the fuel of the liquid fuel sector which is 
you know, which is what it's what it looks at. Um, and also to spur innovation because it is very much a market based approach. So, um, uh, you know, it basically it's it's it kind of functions as, uh, you know, a, a, a closed kind of sector cap and trade program um, where uh, the 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 uh, you know the the, the oil companies are um, you know required to drive down the carbon intensity of their product um, and you know they can do that through um, uh, you know essentially by uh, uh, you know I, I don't want to you know essentially bringing in lower uh, uh, higher cost resources that have a lower carbon value. Um, so right now it's a, it, it, you know, it's a credit that trades anywhere from, you know, 150 to $200. Um, and, uh, you know, that provides a significant, uh, a boost to any developer who wants to, uh, you know, work on carbon capture. So, um, and, and that was enabled also just a couple of years ago with, the uh, you know, with the CCS protocol, which was added into the low carbon fuel standard that would allow for, uh, 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 you know, projects that met certain criteria, certain levels of permanence um, to be, um, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to be used in, in, you know, in that program. Uh, so, for example, if you're, uh, you know, in the Tahoe National Forest, there are, you know, 400,000 uh, three-story high piles of wood. Um, if someone were to, you know, take that wood and turn it into hydrogen and be able to use that, um, these are projects actually we're looking at, and be able to use that, um, you know, for fuel cells or for transportation, um, you know, they could sell those credits to the oil refineries, um, and then that would actually help finance these projects, which would both address a pressing need that California has right now. What are we going to do with these enormous piles of wood, mostly scraps that are, you know, in our national forests, help create economic development here in California, um, and really address the climate crisis, uh, for, you know, by helping to uh, decarbonize the fuel sector. So that's kind of basically how it works. Great. <clears throat> well, that's, that's super useful. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a tax credit, 45Q, Anything between you know twenty five or twenty dollars and fifty dollars, depending on the injection, uh, you know, uh, you know, storage, uh, you know, area, plus potentially if somehow uh, the transportation fuel finds its way to California, the addition of an LCFS credits worth per ton, um, you know, anything between one hundred fifty and two hundred dollars. So we are, you know sending a price signal to the market of about $200. So obviously, if the market identifies an opportunity in the $100 range, well, obviously, uh, that project is in the money. I mean, there are still risks associated with developing the project, undertaking um, a number of modification to a large, you know, uh, industrial facility. And there's also the tail end liabilities associated with these projects, you know, in the event of a release. So they're, they're not as easy as it as they may seem, but at least from a price signal perspective, we can see why all of a sudden people are paying attention and thinking about these projects as as a real as a real um, opportunity as opposed to science fiction. Um, uh, Julio, we, we mentioned some potential amendments to the 45Q. Do you have an update on that? I know you follow the uh, the federal uh, issue pretty closely. Yes, so there's new draft legislation that has been proposed that would do three things. One, uh, it would extend the start date criteria. Today, you have to start a project construction by 2025. For these big projects, that's quite challenging. The one proposed amendment is to extend the date to uh, 2030 allowing for many more projects. The probably the most important proposed provision is to do direct pay as opposed to a transferable non-refundable tax credit, which is its current structure. As Kathy said, uh, that is going to be very important. Uh, we do not, as you said, JP, uh, 
right now there's not enough tax appetite to use all the project uh, opportunity that's out there. So direct pay would actually bring more players on the field and get more projects, and it would increase the value by about another five or six bucks. Last but not least, uh, they're considering specific provisions to raise the incentive, in particular for direct air capture. Uh, there's been a number of proposals floated, but the current draft legislation is for $120 a ton uh, for saline formation storage and $75 for enhanced oil recovery. That additional incentive would certainly make a difference for projects that are right on the fence that are direct air capture projects. If you combine that with the, 40, with the low carbon fuel standard provisions and the CCS protocol that Matt mentioned, it starts to look more interesting. And just to be clear, the direct air capture technology you are referring to, Julio, is this technology that allows a project mm -hmm. to essentially suck in CO2 from the ambient air as opposed to capturing mm -hmm. the CO2 at a direct source. Is that the case? Yes. Because air is very dilute, <laughs> concentrations of CO2, uh, it's simply more expensive uh, and uh, in most cases prohibitively expensive. But uh, if you have enough incentive, you can do it. We've been doing it on submarines and spacecraft since the 40s. We've been separating CO2 from the air. Uh, so we know how to do it. Let me, let me add one last thought. The, we, you asked me about the 45Q provisions, but there's other draft legislation that's very important uh, for CCS as well. Uh, the SCALE Act, which would help finance infrastructure development. Uh, a 48A tax credit amendment, which would serve as an investment tax credit for carbon capture technology. There's others, but uh, I'm delighted to see so much interest and activity in Congress right now focused on incentives and opportunities to deploy CCS. Those would include the 100% clean electricity standard like California has. If that was a national yeah. standard, there would be more power plant retrofits. And last but not least, there is now discussion about expanding the low carbon fuel standard from California into a national program. All of those things would certainly not only bring more renewable and more biomass based sort of solutions onto the field, but it would unquestionably get CCS projects up and running. Fantastic. Fantastic. Obviously, a lot of interesting opportunities, especially now that we have a Biden administration so laser focused on those issues. Um, I want to address um, equity issues in a second because obviously that is central to any discussions of environmental issues today. Before we do that, let's briefly address this question of storage, right? Because, you know, th there are some concerns out there about injecting CO2 underground. There are concerns around releases, uh, catastrophic releases that would cause uh, health issues. There's also a question about, okay, well, if there's a release uh, 15 years from now, who will know, right? And who's going to be liable, if, if anyone, right? So maybe on the technical side, uh, Julio, you can start you know, telling us about whether we have any experience with storing CO2 and how it's worked so far. And then perhaps we can discuss with um, uh, Matt and Kathy uh, what industry and the states are doing about these issues. So let's just start with the science, with the physics and chemistry. Uh, we know that CO2 can stay in the earth for a very long time. The oldest naturally occurring CO2 deposit is 280 million years old. That seems like long enough. Uh, it is also the case that if you have a well-configured site, they can hold CO2 indefinitely. Uh, we know that because we've been doing it for 50 years. The number of leaks have been zero. The number of people harmed has been zero. So we know that we can do it and have do it, done it well. And in fact, the oil and gas industry is extremely well configured to operate and execute these things. And I'm sure that Kathy will, will uh, add to that comment. The last point that most people don't understand is there is already a very strong regulatory framework for this. The Environmental Protection Agency has had a well class dedicated to CO2 storage since 2010. There have been permits done around the United States. Uh, uh, there uh, are very stringent monitoring and management requirements even before you get the permit. <laughs> and once you get the permit, there's very strong operational and monitoring protocols that are required. Uh, so the regulatory framework is quite strong and that's, that really mitigates any even very low level of risk of release. So this is something that is not really a risk and is already well managed. 
Interesting, interesting. So, so Kathy uh, Julio said that some companies have been uh, so storing CO2 for 40 years. I mean, is that the case? Uh, is there anything you can share with us on that front? Uh, yeah, and I definitely appreciate Dr. Friedman's comments because one thing that is very, very clear to us, especially in California, and I think Matt can attest to this, is it, it isn't whether or not we figured out how to capture or as, as we know, Livermore already outlined and, and mapped the entire geology of the state of California. So we know where there are some prime locations for storage, um, whether it's the Delta or whether it's Kern County, there's primary areas. And, and, and then it's how do you connect where you're storing it from where you're getting it, right? That's the big issue. And, and Dr. Friedman noted pipelines obviously uh, are very essential in that equation, as is this spoke concept. But what's What's the most difficult part is to make sure that we engage the public, we engage the environmental justice community on the benefits of this technology and and dispel some of the misinformation. And, I, you know, that comes from us not having a really good education program. It's not the community's issue. It's more how are we going to get out and talk about this issue so that they feel comfortable? Because frankly, in California, the communities own our license to operate. And that will be our bigger, bigger obstacle. We have permitting obstacles. We've got legal obstacles. We got all kinds of obstacles to overcome. And that's kind of in the challenge category. But none of those will matter if we do not start engaging communities in this conversation and, and explain the benefits and the co-benefits of criteria pollutants from doing this as well. So, you know, JP, to me, that will be our biggest obstacle of moving forward uh, in this space. Because, again, we know where it is. We know where to store it, we know how to do it, and it's just getting that acceptance from, from our communities. Great, great. I, I appreciate the comment, uh, Kathy. Matt, you know, my, I had one question for you, but, but Kathy raises some interesting question around equity and how do we involve the local community so that they feel, they, they feel completely engaged with these discussions. But, um, you know, if, if you want to address the, the, the first point, which was my question originally, which is, um, does the state regulate the liability of people who are injecting CO2 and how does that work? You know, can companies disappear after 10 years and walk away and presumably leave the state with the problem or are there systems in place to to monitor that, right? And then second, you know, uh, as a second point, would love to hear your perspective from a community engagement and equi equi equity issues uh, with respect to these types of large infrastructure projects? Um, yeah, so I, I would just say on the safety side first, um, well, I, let me just take a step back. We have, I think there are three kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, externalities uh, around carbon capture that we're deeply concerned about. One is safety, second is uh, pollution, uh, third is economic development. And the, you know, these could be positive or negative. Um, you know, on the safety side, uh, you know, the state's engagement really is through the California Air Resources Board and the ability of a storage facility to uh, meet the strict criteria that CARB has set up uh, around the issue of permanence. Um, uh, in addition, the, uh, you know, the federal government through the US EPA has its own regulations for these kinds of storage wells, they're class six wells. Um, and that's, you know, that, that, that's kind of, we're, we're looking to do all of the work up front to make sure that there aren't problems. Now, issues around liability, um, there are a, a, a other issues around kind of poor space ownership and things like that. Those are all issues that we are actively engaging in um, and I think really will need to be, uh, you know, fleshed out quite quickly. One of the other issues that you didn't raise um, that, that I, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing Dr. Friedman uh, talk about is the issue of seismicity. Um, you know, w will this cause earthquakes? Um, some of the best storage, uh, you know, geologies in the country and possibly even the world are, you know, in the Sacramento Delta. The state has invested enormous amount of resources in, you know, water conveyance, 
Um, you know, we also have a great deal of people who live around those areas. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so uh, that is also an issue that we have been, uh, you know, very engaged with on the safety side, uh, you know, via our uh, California Geologic Survey. Um, so if, if Dr. Friedman can also talk a little bit about that, I think that would also be helpful for the audience. Sure. May I, JP? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, again, uh, there's two risks that people ask about with respect to earthquakes and seismicity. The first is, if there's an earthquake, will the CO2 get out? And the short answer is no. We know how to figure that out. This, we've actually run these experiments where there's been earthquakes near active injection sites and the CO2 doesn't come out. Like, so uh, there, there's, that's a very short conversation for a very long technical topic, but that's really not a risk. There's a secondary question, which is the one that Matt asked about, will injecting CO2 create earthquakes? And the short answer is not really no. Uh, a more comprehensive answer is that when you put anything in the subsurface, when you put water or air or anything else, you make thousands of tiny, tiny, tiny earthquakes. Earthquakes that are less than magnitude zero on the Richter scale, you can't even feel them at the surface. And in fact, there are special technologies we have to monitor those things to make sure that we detect them and understand what they tell us about the rocks. Um, it is also the case that the EPA and the state of California prevent you from operating in a way that would trigger earthquakes. So you can predict whether or not there will be earthquake risk and design your injection to manage away from that. Uh, and again, this has been done in many places around the world. We understand how to do that. So there, it, it's a small but, but a real risk but it's one that is readily managed and where the state is already managing it. Great. <clears throat> Great. I appreciate it. Um, and then on, on the local issue, uh, Matt, did, did you want to say anything about how the state think about, you know, equity issues around CCS projects? Like, are we creating a local problem by trying to solve a, a global one and, what what are the risks of that? What do we know about it? And and what's what's the right way to think about those issues? Um, I I I think the way we're looking at it is you know, and I and I would apply this across the board in the state for any kind of energy project or even industrial projects is you know we're really trying to put forward uh, an equity first uh, 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 stance that. Um, you know, any project uh, would need to get the support or the, uh, or the tacit, uh, you know, support of the of the local communities, the elected officials, um, uh, you know, out there. It, 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 you know, who would be impacted by this? Um, and you know, this includes both. You know, if you're doing kind of a rural capture project with uh, biofuels, or if you're uh, capturing emissions that are just being vented. Uh, carbon dioxide at a hydrogen production facility, um, you know, all of those ones need to be, be engaged. I think the other thing that we're looking at quite actively is, you know, are there positive benefits for um, uh, carbon removal uh, and carbon capture, particularly in the area of criteria pollutants? Um, oftentimes, you'll have to scrub the sulfur dioxide out of the flue gas, which could have very large um, uh, uh, pollution control uh, benefits. Uh, you know, some facilities are looking at running their facilities on hydrogen versus natural gas, or in the case of cement plants, even coal, um, which could also have very large uh, pollution criteria pollution reduction benefits. So, um, you know, I think we're trying to make sure that everything that we're doing uh, uh, around carbon mitigation. Uh, whether it's carbon capture or any other kind of technology, has a positive benefit, uh, positive health benefit, positive economic benefit, uh, you know, for the local community. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense, right? And, um, you know, one would think if, if anyone undertakes a, a CCS project, whether it is in California or in Texas or in my home, sta you know, home state of New York, you know, it will trigger an environmental review process. And under the laws of most jurisdiction in the U.S. at least, you know, there's a stringent review and assessment of what will be the additional 
um, you know, impacts on the population and the environment created by these projects. So hopefully, as we move these projects through the development pipeline, we will be able to run those quantification. Uh, so I, I, I think, I think that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. Um, K Kathy, I mean, speaking of equity issues, right? We, we are facing as a nation an important challenge as we are moving the economy from, you know, uh, predominantly fossil uh, base to something which is more diversified from an energy mix. Um, wh what is the, the role of CCS when it comes down to labor, right? Because we know these massive refinery projects or refineries that are currently in operation in California, for example, of your member companies, they employ hundreds and hundreds of people. These are very good, you know, well-paid jobs, union, very often, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what are we doing and what are your, your member companies doing to, to think about what are we gonna do with these individuals? And how yeah, does absolutely. CCS do that? Yeah. Yeah, and so many conversations have already taken place, JP, uh, around that. Um, uh, everybody is on board with what it's going to take to put CCS projects in California, especially our union labor friends. This is not a conversation they're not having. It's a conversation that they're front and center on. They see and understand the benefits of what CCS provides, not only from a climate change perspective, but frankly, from a, a jobs perspective. And so they have been out front very, very strongly already in, in conversations in the legislature and, and in the governor's office about how important CCS is to California and what role, what critical role from an employment standpoint they will be playing in that, right? To, to build it, to, to, to uh, bring those labor skills uh, to that marketplace is huge. It's absolutely huge. So there's huge support from our companies that utilize uh, this skill set, not only in our traditional facilities, but as you know, as, as we're all looking at even renewable diesel, renewable natural gas, uh, those skill sets are needed and they're equally needed here in CCUS. So it's a lot of, a lot of job potential opportunities. Um, so that's already there. I, I think we're good and I think we're solid there. I think where we really struggle is permitting, um, permitting um, challenges financial uncertainty we already talked about, but lack of infrastructure and legal uncertainty. Those are the four areas that we see we really got to focus on. And we have very specific recommendations on each and every one of those. Well, give us, I, I think that's an interesting segue into, you know, challenges of CCS projects. I think these challenges, you know, I work on CCS projects globally. I think they exist, you know, everywhere. But I have to say they are most acute in California, right? If, if to, you know, we, there are two potential realities, right? 20 years from now, we, we, there's one reality where CCS projects are a little bit everywhere in the United States. They follow the source. They follow the, the sequestration opportunities, which is what you would expect because that's the most cost efficient outcome of, of the allocation of the resources, right? There's the other reality that is a potential, uh, the, the other possibility, which which is possible, right? Which is that all of the projects are gonna be in Texas. And someone has to ask the question, why would be the case? And I think the, the, the potential explanations are permitting, right? And potential ownership issues. So, so Kathy, what kind of recommendations are you working on to make uh, projects in California, uh, you know, feasible from a, a permitting and regulatory certainty perspective? Yeah, thanks, JP. And and how unfortunate would that be if all the projects are in Texas, Texas, and they are utilizing the low carbon fuel standard from California to do that, and we're getting no benefit from that from a jobs perspective or uh, actually emission reduction. So, permitting is obviously one of the biggest obstacles. And why is that? California tends to have a lot of agencies. It's a spider web permitting requirements, whether they're state, regional, or local bodies. So it will involve the coordination of, of many departments within the agencies and at the government level. And I mean, even with a power plant that we've seen, you know, the types of permits that are required for that are, 
are significant. I'm not going to go through them all, but trust me to say it's a spider web. So our recommendation is we need the state to take strong leadership on CCUS, right? We need the state to really get a framework that coordinates and streamlines this process through these regulatory bodies, because otherwise we'll never get off square zero. So our recommendation is get a lead, get this organized, and you know let's start working on how do we streamline this process. And then the lack of dedicated CO2 pipelines, we've talked about that, but we have got to start exploring what that looks like, whether it's a, a hub uh, concept, hub and spoke concept, or how do we get from where we're storing it to where we're getting it. So we know pipelines, as Dr. Friedman said, is the most cost effective means. So that's an area we've got to look at. So getting CARB in the state to play an enabling role there so that we can get a hub and spoke concept going, that we can get the pipeline infrastructure and begin to talk about that is, is very important. And then lastly, on the legal side, JP, as, as you well know in your profession, this has a, a lot of the barriers in it, whether it's liability and poor space ownership, or CO2 ownership or utilization or, or unitization, sorry, and prim primacy rights. All of those um, are many legal questions. And so our recommendation is to get a, get a team of legal experts who can begin to address these questions. Let's start talking about creating a single source permitting process. Let's start talking about a predictable, sustainable credit pathway. Let's talk about CCS within the cap and trade program, and let's get a streamlined CEQA process so we have a chance of moving this forward. Very good. Well, that, that was, uh, you know, that, 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 that is quite a list, but, you know, I, I know these issues very well, Kathy, as you know, and, you know, that there's nothing on that list that is not impossible to address shortly, you know, in California and for that matter, in any other jurisdiction. I think a lot of states and companies are learning by doing. This is, despite the fact that we have 39 projects on the development, et cetera, et cetera, it is still a fairly novel issue. And, you know, quite understandably, states and governments are careful in uh, rolling out the strategies and permitting projects. So I think that's all reasonable and to be expected. But I believe that these additional uh, transition and tweaks, you know, can, can be done going forward. Matt, did you, did you want to uh, react to that and, and explain yeah. how the current situation in California is, uh, is well, you know, what, what it is doing to address some of those issues? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I should just say the, the first step is to develop kind of a statewide consensus or, uh, you know, a rough consensus about, you know, what role these technologies play and where. I think everybody agrees there is a role for them and you know in certain applications and i think we have to just kind of get that happen the place where we're looking to develop that consensus is through the uh california air resources board scoping process um i think additionally you know as we're piloting many of these uh you know projects to you know to kind of learn a bit by doing um you know ones that are already uh, uh you know kind of moving through the process um, it is to use those as opportunities to kind of identify the issues that, you know, some of the issues that, that, that uh, uh, Kathy touched upon and, uh, you know, really see, you know, how much do we need to, you know, which one should we prioritize, which one should get done first, how, how, how should we re respond to those. Um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of like to use the, the you know, kind of the Chinese description of, you know, we're, we're crossing the river and we're feeling the stones beneath our feet um, on this uh, on this issue. It's very important. We've got to cross the river pretty quickly, um, but there's still a little bit of uh, due diligence work to be done here. Great, great. I, I appreciate the feedback. And I think. I think the state's been very open about these issues and has accepted to work with industry. And I think it's a collaboration exercise that everyone in industry very much appreciates. So, so Matt, thank you to you and your agency for all of your work on these issues and your leadership. Uh, it's absolutely outstanding and it's been uh, extremely uh, well received. 
Um, Dr. Friedman, let me uh, ask you to uh, to make perhaps some concluding thoughts. Uh, if we have the time, maybe Matt and, and Kathy can can supplement. But Julio, if if we if we were to have the this panel, you know, five years from now at NACW in uh, 2026, uh, where where would you like to be? What, what would you like to be talking about? Where do you think we we should be in terms of scaling out, uh, scaling up and deploying CCS technology around the Are we going to still be talking about permitting issues or do you realistically believe that at that point we, we will have projects to talk about CO2 going into the ground and, you know, some, uh, you know, real reduction on, on the emissions pathway, right, that can be attributed to CCS projects? So I really believe that we'll have operating projects or projects under construction in the state five years from now, and that we'll be uh, thanking each other for all of the hard work we did in overcoming these barriers. And the most important barrier is actually just the trust barrier that, that Mary was alluding to before. We need to trust that investors will get their money back. Communities need to trust that actors are good and the state will act on their behalf. They have to trust they'll receive the benefits that Matt laid out. Um, I think we're building that trust right now. Uh, but I think people are going to put the money in place, and I think we need to because we will not reduce emissions quickly enough if we do not put that money in place. We've got to bend the curve, uh, and that's going to require some work. I also think that uh, what I really want to be talking about a couple of years from now is is not sort of have, I hope we're past all the permitting issues and I hope we're past the infrastructure issues. I hope we'll have a couple of dedicated pipelines that just move CO2 from A to B. And what I think we're gonna be talking about instead is how do we integrate CO2 removal technology, things like biohydrogen, things like direct air capture with the CCS to help meet the state's negative emissions goals, the net zero component of that that's essential. And I think we're gonna be talking about how we can move into other sectors using these technologies. How hydrogen, for example, can help with shipping and with trucking and these other applications and get further, faster, deeper decarbonization. Uh, I sincerely hope that's the case. Time will tell. Fantastic. Well, I think it's a great vision and I certainly would be uh, delighted if we were to reach that point. Kathy or Matt, any concluding, concluding thoughts to share with, uh, with the audience? Yeah, I think I would just uh, agree on the trust factor that Dr. Friedman put out there, but I'd add to that the political will. We've got to have the political will to move this forward, because with, with all due respect, I have been walking across this river on these stones since 2015, and my feet are getting a little sore. So I'm encouraged by the conversation. Um, I, I think the policy driver of carbon neutrality is what got the interest of California going here because we have been talking about it for quite a while. So I would I would just end with um, something I read from the conclusion of the policy action plan for CCS that Stanford put out in October of last year. And that is motivate, maximize, enable, and unlock the pathways for success. If we can focus on that, build the trust, we can get some projects and steal in the ground and get going. Well, that's great. Hey, can I just that's add for, please, just, just, I know we're out of time, um, but, but I would just say, you know, everything we know about the science says we've got to keep a lot of options on the table. We have a lot of difficult challenges, whether it's industrial applications, whether it's, you know, the, uh, the emissions that we have, that we just can't abate, um, you know, or whether it's, uh, you know, possibly residual power uh, out there. And to be able to succeed by 2045, we've all got to work together on solving, you know, on addressing on addressing these problems. Um, I would say if we could create some, you know, rough consensus, uh, you know, among the various stakeholders, uh, you know, in this area, we could, you know, we we could look to the uh, uh, example of renewable energy, where within 10 years, you know, we were able to transform the electricity system. So I think this is really a, you know, I, I agree with everybody who said trust building is super important. 
um, looking at the concerns of all of the stakeholders and bringing them engaged into, the, into rooms where they may not be, um, and then developing plans where we're all working together to move this goal forward. California has a history where we can do that, you know, in spite of some of the obstacles that people have laid out. Um, let you know, let's use that as a roadmap. Fantastic. Well, Matt, uh, these were very good concluding thoughts. Um, you know, I want to take the last 15 seconds to thank each of you, the panelists, for joining me today. It was a wonderful event. I really appreciate the discussion. I am sure the audience did as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And uh, we hope uh, to have another one of those next year at NECW. In the meantime, be safe, be healthy, and uh, we will be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, JP.